In this video, it is the DES Racing DSD1 Super Minimalistic RC Drift Chassis. We're going to be assembling it and looking at any tips and tricks that you might need to know before you assemble this chassis. I've heard from some folks online that also got them already and said that maybe there's a few things you need to watch out for. And so this might be a little bit of an adventure as we do it. Let's get started. We're going to be getting all the parts out of the box. Nice folded up instruction manual at first glance. It seems fine, so that's good. We have a list of all the parts, so that'll be useful to make sure we're not missing anything. Parts are in here. Most things it looks like are bagged and numbered, which is awesome. Not a lot to that carbon fiber chassis right there. Again, this is about as minimalistic as you can get. Uh, assembling the kit, here is the majority really of what I used. Scissors obviously to open up all the boxes, a couple pairs of pliers, some just regular uh, you know, lockjaw pliers in order to hold some parts, needle nose pliers in order for some of the smaller ones, and then uh, one and a half millimeter and two millimeter speed tips along with my electric driver. And then uh, the magnetic tray, I actually ended up using two of the magnetic trays just to hold all the parts as we went through. We had Loctite, of course, and we're gonna need more and more of it. And you're gonna need some diff fluid uh, that you need to put into that rear differential. But that's really all we need in order to get it to a chassis. Okay, tip number one, uh, not all the bags are actually labeled. So as an example, bag one, is all of these things and that bag had absolutely uh, no markings on it whatsoever. So it turns out not all the bags are actually marked and they're not in order. So as an example, this is bag one, great. That's on step one, bag one, great. But then these hex bolts, they were in bag 19. And then these ball cups, as near as I can tell, the only ball cups that are in the whole thing is bag 15. So you are definitely not going to be working like bag one to bag 20. It appears that it is going to be skipping all over the place as a word of warning. Down here on step four, we're stacking a whole bunch of parts together. And at first I was very concerned. I found the CP7, 9, and 10 rather quickly, but then there's this eight here. And if you look over here in the carbon parts, there is no CP8. I finally found it. I think it's this metal piece. It's all alone in a package by itself. According to the instructions, it should be in bag 20 with the diff. It was not. It was all alone for me at least. So I assumed I was stacking up a whole bunch of carbon parts. If you look at it, it looks like it's drawn thinner. So that means it gives me some comfort that it's probably this. But anyway, it was a little bit of a concern at first as to what exactly was going on there. Step number six here. It took me a while to find this hex tube. It's white. It's white. It is in bag 17. So that was correct. And it was labeled, but I, I don't know. I just assumed it was something different, maybe metal or something like that. It took me a while to find it. And then it tells you to put it in an M3 by 10 hex bolt. You're going into this metal threaded part down here in the bottom. But if you take one of these, you're, you're putting this M3 by 10 into two parts that just it easily threads into. So it's really kind of hard to force it in and get it even on both sides. If it screws all the way into this plastic piece, there's literally like three threads hanging out there. That's not awesome. Uh, so I was struggling to find a way to keep it maybe halfway and screw into both parts. So I rated my spare parts for an M3 by 15. And that way I can use this, thread it all the way in. And there's still plenty of material sticking out there now that it's tight on this side for it to screw in here. I have zero concerns about that coming loose, right? Like right here is a great time to point out that so much of this kit is using these just standard M3 nuts, right? These are not lock nuts. Okay, a lot of times when you're building a kit, it'll come with a lock nut, which means when you put it through, it has a little plastic on the inside. It keeps the nut from backing out. If you're old enough like me to have ever played with an erector set or something like that, you know that if you just put these together like this, 
without any Loctite, they are going to come loose and you are going to lose them. This is a fact of life with these little nuts. So after I am done building this kit, I am going to come back and I am going to gob Threadlocker on every single one of these nuts like this. Maybe even this part with that nut in there. Uh, the things in here. I'm going to come back and take it all apart and put Threadlocker on all of it. But I don't know right now exactly <laughs> if all these are really in the right spot and exactly what I need to do yet. So I'm not doing it yet, but note that you're going to need to do that. In step seven here, it shows you how to assemble one of the, it looks like one of the front hubs. It doesn't tell you to assemble two of them. And the other important thing to note is I don't think you're going to assemble two of probably the same side. You're probably going to take, this is the one that it tells you to make. You're probably going to want to assemble one of these in the same fashion. Down here on step 10, I'm supposed to have two of these CP16 parts straight in the bag that it was included in. There's literally only one. Now this is a problem because when we jump over here, we're actually putting a bearing in it. Very similar to what we did up here where you needed two. You needed a four millimeter wide area. So that's two millimeter plus two millimeter in order to appropriately hold one bearing. And even more on step 10 here. Uh, it says to use an m3 by 15 bolt to go through it over here in the parts list there's no m3 by 15 there's an m3 by 14 so i assumed i was just a typo and i grabbed those m3 by 14s false though because when you stack all this up the 14 doesn't even go through there i jumped forward a few steps here as i was trying to figure out really how this is supposed to go together and i thought i figured out that the amount of parts used in the kit is actually correct. There's only one of these little bearing holders in here. Uh, and that with a 20 ish, 20, just a slightly over 20 millimeter bolt will get you everything that you need here. 20 millimeter bolt will get you lined up and all the parts go in. You skip forward a few steps and you start putting all of these other pieces together. If that was thicker, it wouldn't all go together correctly. The only thing that was actually wrong was the instructions that showed two of these parts together. Because now we're over here at step 13 and you go from assembling the transmission case to just magically having an assembled diff. It's all the parts are here. So you have to assemble the diff on your own and they don't tell you how to do it. Now to assemble this diff, I'm going to start with one side here. You have the drive cup. We're going to stick the drive cup through. Next on top of that drive cup is going to go one of these O-rings. I am going to put some team associated green slime on those. Because if you really goo it up good and stick it down on there, then that will help the diff from leaking. We have these little metal shims. I'm assuming those go next. A lot of the times those will go down there to help, again, push against that seal. We're going to then grab some small needle nose, one of these little pins. You want to get it roughly centered. So you have the drive cup, O-ring with some slime on it, a uh, washer, and then the pin. And at that point, that is then assembled. You're going to do the exact same thing to the side. With those assembled on either side, you should be able to now take these sun gears and make sure that they line up with those pins. If it goes all the way down. Now we have two cross pins here and you have four gears. And typically what you're going to do is these cross pins have a little flat in them. You're going to put those across each other to create a cross, an X. And then these gears are going to go on each one like this, all the way around and then slide it in. But there's something wrong here with mine. One of mine is cut with a flat spot directly in the middle. The other one's up, off the half here. Here's an up close shot. Um, that is really, really bad. So I am fortunate that I don't remember why, but for some reason I bought a whole spare diff. I don't remember why I did this, but I remember seeing that he was advertising it and for some reason I thought I needed to do it, and I did, and I'm really glad I did because now I can come right in here and I can snag this other pin out of this spare diff that I brought. Otherwise, I would be absolutely hosed. So this is really, really disappointing because if, this, if I didn't happen to buy the spare diff, these parts would not be able to go back together. That's pretty disappointing create a little cross with them 
and now we have a diff. Now we can then assemble this side to this side, but it's dry. There's nothing in there. And of course the kit does not come with any fluids. I recently built a uh, team associated DC 10. It came with this 2000 CST fluid. It's about a 200 weight. I'm going to go ahead and just put it in there. Obviously you can use the fluid of your choice. It's a tuning aid for your diff. So you don't have to just use what I use. Use what works for you. It is a tuning aid. You will change it. Now we have one working and assembled diff. You can kind of work it and see, does it sm feel smooth? Is it nice and smooth in there? And that is how you assemble that diff. And you might need to, if you're buying one of these, buy a spare diff just in case. With all this assembled, I will say this is not a free spinning diff at all. These gears are, it's like the mesh is just designed a little bit too tight. Now, I think once you start driving it, it'll naturally wear a little bit and free that up. But I'm going to warn you, watch your motor temperatures. <laughs> You're going to probably think you have drag brake on for the first little bit that you drive it. It's like the spacing here between these three is just not quite right. Uh, it actually tells you to use M3 by 10 bolts on this whole side. And it's got to be wrong. I don't know if it comes across there in the GoPro or not, but those M3x10s actually stick all the way in to all the mounting holes on all four of these. I'm guessing that's wrong and that we're going to have to pull those out and put uh, M3x6s in there because otherwise you're not going to be able to use any of those holes. Boo. Wrong instructions yet again. All right, we made it to step 15, 16, 16. We made it to step 16. We're assembling, it looks like, the rear control arm. And we have multiple problems here. So first off, they don't really tell you. You have to kind of figure out exactly which way these go. You stack up, you stack up two of these two millimeter little pointy bits plus a two millimeter piece of carbon fiber. And then it tells you to put a six millimeter screw through both all of them. Well, how much sticks out there for you to then thread it in? Zero. Raiding some screws to get other screws. So now I'm gonna raid my 10 millimeter screw. All right, but then of course it's still gonna be floppy, so you have to put something on the inside. They tell you to put one more of these M3 by 10 screws in here. Guess what? At this point, I'm out of them. So this was me raiding my spare parts bin in order to get two more of them. So now yet again, the hardware and everything is wrong for the vehicle. Step 17, I think we're mounting the front bumper here. Uh, and again, super duper staggeringly small screw trying to come through here in order to screw on the front bumper. And it's just not long enough. The hole's not quite drilled in the right spot. And so it won't go through and it won't catch the nut. And every now and then it'll try to catch, but it's like a half a thread. As soon as you put anything on it, it comes right back off. So once again, diving for longer screws because what's included isn't just quite right. Making progress here. Look at this. It's actually starting to look a little bit like a drift car. Um, honestly, at this point, I've kind of given up on just telling you about every screw that's the wrong size, doesn't fit, wrong thing. I just, I'm just going for it at this point. I've pulled multiple screws out of my uh, spare parts bin, all that kind of stuff, just to make this thing happen. So that's the biggest word of warning for you. But I figured I'd say something nice now. So this right here, we're just mounted up the transmission here to the rear of the car. This right here, here is genius. I absolutely love this. The number of times I've had a drift chassis and I've needed to do some funky things with the suspension and all that to get it to fit a body because the wheelbase wasn't quite right. And look at this. Probably, if I figure out how they did this here, that's probably 10 to 15 millimeters of forward and back wheelbase adjustment with a change of four screws and nothing else. That is actually really smart and I hope some other manufacturers pay attention to that and hopefully copy that because that's really nice. Yes, yes, I will admit that in that previous clip I just showed you, no, I did not have the control arms on. Um, so yes, I had to take it back off and put the control arms on, which of course meant I needed different size screws again. Uh, note that this does give you the freedom to adjust rear toe pretty easily and you can smash in and out the track width just a little bit as well, but mostly just the rear toe here. So I'm leaving those bottom screws just slightly loose until I have the ability to actually do something with that uh, and try to actually set this car up. Because so I'm guessing 
that's probably not a good alignment. So we're going to have to work on how do I actually set this alignment. Um, at this point, this is just getting humorous, if I'm honest. Like, it's either depressing or humorous. I don't... I don't this, this part appears to just be too long. I've looked back through the instructions. Literally come all the way back here to the first page. Back here to where I did this. This is supposed to be a 3 by 6 by 16 tube. If I measure it, it's over 18 millimeters long. So now I need to cut this tube down because this is supposed to connect up here to this front brace. Back here to that back brace. But it turns out, no, of course not. It's the wrong length. It's the only one. It's the only one of those in the whole box. And it's the wrong length. So we're going to have to get a, a small saw out and cut it down to the right dimension. All right. So we get down here. This is step 27. We've bolted this on. Now we go to step 03, which is really odd because that doesn't, doesn't make sense. The instructions then end. And I was like, you know what? This is awesome. I'm done. Look at me, I have a drift chassis now. Uh, but then I started to notice, I was like, wait, why did my bearing fell out? Like, my bearing shouldn't fall out. And I noticed that I still had hexes and pins. And I was like, it's kind of odd that I have spares of those. It never actually tells you to put the axles in. If you go back and look at it, you never drive shafts. You never actually, never actually tells you to put the drive shafts in. So probably up here at step 26, put your axles in because otherwise you will get here and you'll wonder when was I supposed to put them in. I think the axles are actually like a millimeter or two too long. You can see it's literally all the way in the bottom of the cup. I think it's binding. Uh, I think it is. I mean, it moves. It does the thing. I guess it'll wear in over time it'll wear in and loosen up a little bit but it has definitely got some binding going on in there uh steering appears to work we finally figured out why these are in here those are actually steering stoppers look at that so we have steering stoppers steering gets to about 90 degrees you can see very open ackerman so we'll probably try to do something about that after we get going a little bit so like uh alignment definitely needs tuned in because even like with this up here we can just tweak it. It's hard to do one-handed. You can tweak it side to side. So like, look at the caster over here. And then this one's like actually the other direction. Like this just wiggles, like everything wiggles because it's like a freaking erector set with these itty bitty screws and these M3 non-locking nuts and how everything has multiple degrees of freedom around it. Like you just don't build, you just don't bolt it together. There is definitely some tweaking that is gonna need to be done afterwards. And looky here now, I finally have, I have axles in and everything. We finally have a drift car. I will be very, very curious. I mean, the whole thing that piqued my interest about this car from the very beginning was the absolute minimalistic nature of it and the lightweight of it. Just, you know, how will it perform in something just this simple? And so I'm still very intrigued by it. I am, of course, disappointed in the instructions, the parts that were included, how the whole thing went together. That is disappointing. I am sad about that. Now that we're nearing the end, uh, I just, I guess I'm hopeful at this point. I'm hopeful that I can get it running, get it driving, get some laps on it, and hopefully it performs like I would like it to. Um, I think the lack of suspension obviously is going to be, you know, that's going to be something that slows it down. Turns out suspension is good. But I'll be curious just how the car drives. So more to come on that. But I still have something now that I need to do in order to wrap this whole thing up. It's a combination of two different things. It's a combination of staggering amounts of Loctite uh, in order to hold this stuff together. I think I'm honestly also going to be replacing some of this hardware with uh, some slightly longer screws. Um, ones that I can also then, I'm going to buy a whole bunch of M3 lock nuts so that a lot of these very important parts can actually be lock nutted together so that I don't have to worry about those itty bitty little M3 nuts coming loose as I drive around. I'm afraid if you just tried to drive it as assembled, you're going to end up constantly coming back, chasing alignment because as the alignment, as any of this moves, the alignment changes. 
So you're going to be constantly chasing that. You're going to be constantly chasing screws and nuts left all over the track and that kind of thing. So I think, yes, I understand small screws help with minimal weight, but we're going to come back and add some longer, bigger screws, some lock nuts in order to just make sure this car doesn't just fall apart on us. Um, all these uh, screws that are going into these blue blocks and everything, all of that's going to need to get Loctited, all of this here, everything. We're going to basically now blow it apart and re and Loctite it. I hope you found this video helpful. If you have any questions about what I did or anything about this kit, please leave them down in the comments below and I will uh, try to get back to you as soon as I can. Thank you for watching and goodbye.